Welcome to Mike Morrison Ministries Church at the Barn, Tuesday night Bible study. Let's uh, start tonight, um, please, in uh, Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament, the last chapter. In, uh, I'll read verse 1 and 2 in the Amplified Bible. For behold, the day comes that shall burn like an oven, and all the proud and arrogant, yes, all that do wickedly and are lawless, shall be stubble. The day that comes shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, that it will leave them neither root nor branch, they'll be finished. And this this wicked that's going to be burnt up is all the enemies of God that have been causing trouble forever, laid bare in Ephesians chapter 6. It's the principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, wicked spirits in heavenly places, and the devil himself, Satan, And at that time, when this happens, it'll be the end of the thousand-year millennium when this comes to pass, finally. There'll be a thousand-year reign of Jesus on the earth when the devil's locked up. At the end of that thousand years, he'll be released for a short season, the Bible says. And at the end of that short season, this verse takes effect. And he's going in the pit forever and ever to return. And... uh, That's the great white throne judgment in the Bible. There's two judgments in the Bible, the judgment of the church and the great white throne judgment that judges evil. And uh, Now verse 2, But unto you who revere and worshipfully fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise, with healing in his wings and his beams. And you shall go forth and gamble like calves, released from the stall and leap for joy. That wants you to notice the spelling in any translation there is not S O N, Son of Righteousness, like it usually is the name of Jesus. This is S U N, and it's not a misprint. And the beams are the, the, what's painted on hot rods when you see the flames on a hot rod or the the pictures of the sun that they take now, you can see the ball of fire and there's flames lapping off the sun of righteousness will uh, arise with healing in his wings. Now, The first verse is definitely the end of the millennium. The second verse is in stages, I believe. What I want to to focus on tonight is that it happened in Acts chapter 2. So let's turn there. Acts chapter 2, the son of righteousness. uh, Arose with healing in his wings, right here, in Acts chapter 2, verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, What's that? The wings. The fire of God. Do you, you see these Renaissance pictures with this little halo boop over there? That's not what this is talking about. This is the sun, S-U-N, of righteousness with healing in those wings. The, it's the same sun, the same glory that was in the Ark of the Covenant in the Old Testament that only one person ever could get close to, and that would be the high priest in that particular day, one person that could get in there in up next to the box that the Son of Righteousness inhabited in that temple. 
And uh, if anything went wrong and he hadn't went through all the ritual and done everything right, then he's, the bells that were on him quit ringing. He had a rope tied around his ankle and they'd drag him out of there. Nobody would go in there to get him because he was the only one that could go in there and live through it. And they didn't always, evidently. So uh, this, what I'm getting at right now, is that son of righteousness, when Jesus was crucified, came out of that holy of holies. The temple veil was rent from top to bottom, 20 feet, 20 feet high or 40 feet high. I think it's 40 feet. Four inches thick of uh, woven wool split signifying he'd left. And he was gone while Jesus was on the earth ministering uh, for 40 days. And then Jesus said, go in the upper room and wait. And they got there in about a week. Here he come. The son, S-U-N, of righteousness with healing in his wings. The fire of Almighty God that was in the temple came in that upper room it got all over all of them and then whoosh, went down inside of them. And they went outside and preached the gospel in tongues that they didn't understand, languages they didn't understand, to the people gathered in Jerusalem from all over the world, civilized world. And they all heard the good news of the gospel in their own language. And it, by the end of that day, that, that son had went in 3,000 more people. And the church was born and took off. And you read the first five, six, seven, eight chapters of Acts, and it just kept growing and multiplying. A word would preach, people believed the word, and the word would grow and multiply. And, that, and what they were teaching, what had them so excited was that power of God that had been locked up in the temple was on the inside of them now. They called themselves the way. They didn't call themselves Christians. The people watching called them Christians or little anointed ones. Christ was the anointed one. The world saw it and called them Christians. But they called herself the way, and it was short for the way into God's presence, the way into that power that had been locked up in the Holy of Holies, in that ark, changed and went in them, and they're now the ark. They're now the ark of the covenant. I bring all that up and want to go through all that again because that is the center point of the key to why it you know, answers all the old hippie questions: Who am I? Why am I here? What's this all about? Is this is the key. God, God created this whole place on purpose for his human, his man, male and female. He created them, and he filled them with his self. The son of righteousness lived on the inside of them to such an extent they didn't even know they did they didn't know about skin. All they could see was the light of God. They were a fire made in his image. He's a fire from the loins down, a fire from the loins up, and they were too. And then when they fell, they run around trying to find something to cover their naked bodies up with because they had been dressed in light. And that light had to get out of there so it didn't wipe them out. Just like it, like it would... A high priest that didn't do everything just right, it would have taken out God's only two people on the earth. And he'd turned the earth over to them already. Could not afford to lose those two people because it was theirs, not his. He'd give it away to them for a time. And during that time, it was theirs. And they spoofed it off, Adam did, spoofed it off to the devil. And the devil had it for 4,000 years until... Another Adam got in the earth, Jesus. And he also had the son of righteousness in him because he wasn't born. There was no male involved in his birth. The Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary, and she gave birth to Jesus. And it was the man that sinned. The woman was deceived. The man wasn't. 
So it was the male part that kept everybody born in sin. All of us were born the way Adam and Eve left us, except Jesus. Hallelujah. The devil didn't see that part. And uh, Jesus finally got into hell where he paid the price for what all, everybody's done wrong, and he came back to life, and he whipped all the forces of hell. One righteous man whipped them all, led them through the heavenlies in a triumph, triumphed over them. And then he told us, I'm going, you're staying. And the things I do, things I did while I was here, you'll be doing for me, and I'm going to be in heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father, and I'm going to be your high priest, and I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to mediate for you. I'm going to do, be your, I'm going to be your Lord. And, uh, and he did. That's where it went. So, the point of this Bible study is we're still in that church age. There isn't anything changed from the day they came out in the upper room except we've got more information than they had. They didn't have a Bible yet. They didn't have the revelations that Jesus gave Paul. They didn't have Ephesians and Galatians and First and Second Corinthians and Romans and book letter after letter after letter explaining how God did all this and why and what it's for. And we do. Hallelujah. We have the New Testament, the New Covenant that was bought and paid for, ratified with the God's blood. God's blood bought and paid for our righteousness. So, if that's what God did, and that's the crux of what of the center of the gospel, and I say it is, when Jesus preached, we went over this last week. This is just a bit of a refresher. If you didn't see, if you didn't look at last week's message, you should to get caught up on what we're about to get into here. But Jesus preached this message: the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. Now, technically, it's the same, not technically, it's the same thing, but the kingdom of heaven is the, way, is the kingdom that's in the invisible realm that God lives in, that created this visible realm we live in. The kingdom of heaven is there, the kingdom of God is in the earth, the kingdom of God is a copy of the kingdom of heaven. And the kingdom is the system or the way things are done in heaven. And it's not a democracy. It's not a uh, constitutional republic. It has a constitution, but it's a constitution given to us by a king, an eternal king who is absolutely perfect and will never die. It's a kingdom that's always been, always will be, and will never die, the kingdom of heaven. Jesus set it up in earth. The Father decided what he wanted. The Word set it, and the Spirit of God made it. Made the earth, made everything in Genesis chapter 1, got down to man, made man that way, and turned this place over to man and told him, now you be the speaking spirit, and you call things. And when you call things, the anointing power of God that created it all in the first place, who lives on the inside of you now because you're a temple of the Holy Spirit of God, he'll bring it to pass. You say it, he'll bring it to pass. You say it, he'll bring it to pass. They spoofed it off pretty fast, and it wouldn't work. For 4,000 years. Then here come Jesus, and he'd say it, and the Holy Spirit in him would bring it to pass. And he'd say it, and the Holy Spirit would br bring it to pass. And when he came back from the dead, he said, you go wait in the upper room. That Holy Spirit's coming back, and he's going to come in you. He told 500 people, over 500 people to do that, and 120 did. 
But when 120 people come out, got 3,000 more that day, and it began to grow over that. Now, I'm, what I'm saying all that, because this hasn't changed. That simple gospel is the gospel today. And the only way the devil can stop this thing from freight training him is to get people off the main subject onto minor subjects. And boy, has he been good at that. It, there isn't anything that is studied less, probably, than this central point that Jesus preached. This was his message, the kingdom of God has come. The kingdom of God is here. Just look up that phrase, kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God, and you'll see it 55 times in, in Matthew, I think, 44 times in John. And uh, you see it a couple of times, one to three times in the other letters in the New Testament, but it was mainly Jesus talking about it. For three and a half years, he preached this same message everywhere he went. The kingdom of God's here. It's back. Adam spoofed it off, but it's back. And what God's plan is, is to reproduce the invisible in the visible. So the devil has got religion backwards, and here's religion's plan. We got to get to heaven. Let's, get, let's teach people how to get to heaven. It's all about getting to heaven when you die, and it's not. Adam and Eve never, they were never in heaven. <laughs> they didn't get to heaven for 900 and some years, even after they messed everything up, probably pretty early in the deal. They still live 900 years down here where they belong before they got to heaven, and the only reason they're in heaven now is they're waiting for Jesus to fix this thing so they can come back here. God didn't create he, man to get him into heaven. He created man to get him in the earth and it, it, read the book. He's bringing it down here. This isn't about men getting to heaven. This is about God getting heaven and earth. It is such a privilege to be a believer and have God given us this whole place to run. Now, he's the king, and we can't make up anything. We operate inside his rules, inside his boundary, inside his word. But when we get inside that word and we see what he's turned over to us and when what he's told us to do, then it would behoove us to make it as important to us as it was to Jesus. And if we did make it as important to us as it was to Jesus, there wouldn't be so many denominational splits, factions, and then splits and factions inside the splits and factions. We wouldn't have 800 and some denominations all fighting over some dumb little thing that doesn't matter a hill of beans of the kingdom of God anyway. You know, churches split over what, how big the parking lot is and the color of carpet and the bill. There isn't anything a church hasn't split over. Ex what difference does it make when God turned this whole planet over to man, let's get on the right page. The only way to get believers out of diapers, messing their pants, and into body armor where they're fighting hell, is to grow up out of the things that absolutely childish and get in on the center theme of the Bible and keep it simple. If God set something up for us to reign over as kings, that's what we ought to be doing. That's what we ought to be focusing on. If it took up the center of Jesus' message, it should take up the center of our ministries as ambassadors for Christ. We're ambassadors in this world representing that kingdom and heaven in the earth. Let's read that. Uh, Mark 6. Is that where the... 
I think it, Matthew 6, excuse me, Matthew 6. Um, and let, I'm going to use the Amplified Bible here, uh, starting in verse 9. Jesus is criticizing the way uh, religious people pray here. In fact, in verse 8, he said, Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. He, you know how much time people spend in their prayer time asking God for stuff he's already given them? And Jesus said right there, don't be like that. Don't, don't be like that. Here's what you do. Note verse 9. Pray like this. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed, kept holy, be your name. That's set apart, special. Your kingdom come. Your kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, come into earth. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven and left remitted, let go of the debts we have forgiven up, resentment against our debtors, and lead, bring us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is, here we go, the kingdom and the power, that's the Holy Spirit, and the glory, that's his manifest presence in the earth. Forever. That's what it's all about. The kingdom, the power, the Holy Spirit, and his manifesting that presence in the earth. That's it. This is the center. This is a key right here. And the, uh, um, this is the what Jesus taught Old Testament people to pray. Now, if you'll notice, verse 10 said, your kingdom come. It did. God put it in the earth and, and uh, Adam spoofed it off. But Jesus got it back. And we've already been through that on the, on the day of Pentecost it came. And the Spirit of God came down on the inside of people and he went, quit living in a temple made by hands, and he came into temples of flesh, got back inside of people where he always intended to be in the first place. That, so the kingdom of heaven came down here so that the kingdom of God in the earth is alive now. Wherever, the, wherever there's a king, little k, with the spirit of almighty God living on the inside of him, the kingdom is. As an ambassador representing that kingdom, wherever you're at is sovereign soil of the kingdom you represent. You re represent the kingdom of heaven, and therefore where you're standing is the kingdom of God. Who you're talking to is being affected by the kingdom of God, and when you decree something as a king under the king, He's given you the power of attorney to use his name so that when you say something, that covenant comes into effect. And it works for us just like it did for Jesus. We decree as a king, and the spirit of God that lives on the inside of, it, of us makes it happen. Remember, the earth, it was in the Father. It was his plan. Jesus said it for him. In the invisible, he set it into he set it into this realm, and the Holy Spirit made it, and it still works the same way. We have everything that the Father has assigned us to do. In promises and in explanations, and and Jesus seated at His right hand. We'll declare it before him. When we declare it here, our high priest repeats it to the Father. 
and the Spirit of God on the inside of us makes it happen. That should be so exciting that once you get a hold of it, you would think you'd never let it go. And yet, it is no telling what, that what this religious system can get a believer more interested in than the kingdom. It's going to a Christian bookstore and look at, you'll know what sells by the number of books on that subject. And you'll have a hard time finding books on this subject. The number one thing God had on his mind the whole time he was here, Jesus, this was his message. And that's not what you're going to find in those bookstores. There'll be all kinds, there'll be books on church growth, There'll be books on uh, cell groups and how to meet, how to grow a church from a little church to a big church, how to do, they're just volume after volume after volume of ways to get um, uh, things to happen. Or Jesus had a better idea. Walk with God and reign. Things will happen. <laughs> Take the authority he's given you and use his name. Take a stand, and having done all to stand, stand and rule and reign and fight. And don't cave in just because everything doesn't look like it's going good. What am I doing wrong? Well, you might be doing something right. God didn't say this is a cakewalk. You know, when he said his burden was light and his yoke is easy, it's talking about this right here. Here's why it's light. Our job's to say it. How heavy is that? Our job is to believe it in our heart, say it with our mouth. His job, he's got the heavy lifted. He's got to bring it to pass. And you know something? He's good at it. Real good at it. So here we go. I want tonight to uh, to look at five, I don't know what you call these things, points, principles, uh, five, five things to put somewhere to keep in the forefront of your thinking in this year 2023, what's left of it, and uh, going into next year. I mean, it's an important time on earth right now. This thing that's going on in the Middle East is no small incident. I believe it's Psalm 83 being played right out in front of us real time. And I believe the next war is Ezekiel 37, 38, and uh, this one's setting the page for it. Same players. They're going to get whipped this time in, uh, in, uh, by the Israel. It won't be Israel whipping them next time. It'll be Almighty God, Jehovah, doing it for Israel. And uh, it's coming, and it's coming real soon. Kind of like uh, the old movie theaters coming to a theater to near you real soon. <clears throat> This is playing out in real time. We have made it to the end. And it is time to quit playing in the kindergarten, pulling each other's hair. And it's time to put on the armor and get in a fight every day. Get up looking for a fight. If there's not one handy, pick one. We're the head, not the tail. We're in charge, not the devil. We don't need to wait for something to go wrong before we attack. We can pick a fight. There's plenty going wrong. You know, you know when, when you see something on the, on the newscast and you see what's wrong, that's enough. Now go pick a fight. You can fight about that. If it's wrong, you're here to fight it. Pick that one. 
Well, I like to I like to know everything that's going wrong before I decide which one I want to pray about. <clears throat> you could you could have your own newscast given to you by the Holy Spirit be more effective because you get the truth that way. Instead of the world's point of view of what's going on, which is always off, it's just a matter of where is it off and how far is it off. It's always off, and I don't care whose network is doing it. If it's coming from the world, it's off. The Spirit of God is never off. He's always on, right smack in the middle every time. So the first I, I guess I'll just call this a statement I want to make. Um, if we are to exercise our full status and potential as ambassadors for the Father in this earth, for that kingdom of heaven in this kingdom on earth, then we've got to reset we have to do something about our mindset. We have to put on purpose in our mind the object of the event and keep it there. Because everything in this world is designed to take your mind off of that. Everything. Even some of the horrible things that are going wrong are going wrong to take believers' minds off their assignment on the earth to say, oh my, that's terrible. How could, how could we let that happen? How could the government let that happen? How could the, um, how, how could, uh, the court system let that happen? How could the library... You know, how could they just blame this and blame that and blame that? I get a better question. How come the church let that happen? We're the ones with the God-given authority. They have man's authority. We have God-given authority. They have, they have man's power. We have the anointing of the Holy Spirit. I'll tell you how they did it. They convinced God's army to sit down and shut up because they're the silent majority. That's how they did it. We need a different mindset. We need to have the mindset that uh, some of the church leaders had during the revolution in the 1700s. It was the church preachers that put freedom in the heart of the colonists. They preached it in there. They preached it over and over and over and over and over from pulpit after pulpit after pulpit. 26 or 27 of the people that signed the Declaration of Independence were ordained ministers. It came from the Word of God and the freedom in the Bible. And we never should have got off of it, and we never should have got caught silent. We never should have let the, d the demonic forces convince people that it wasn't fair for 75 or 80 percent of America to run the other 20 percent. That's just not fair. If they want to, if they want to be absolutely Bible backward, they have a right to be absolutely Bible backward. And on top of that, we're supposed to shut up and let them do it without a fight. How can you be in the army of God and not put up a fight? When evil is running roughshod over something, how can the army of God sit there and not fight? Especially when the fight is this hard. In the name of Jesus, I arrest that situation. That's not the blessing, that's a curse, and I speak life into it in Jesus' name. The king just spoke. A king of the kings just spoke and had the authority to do it in the name of Jesus, and here comes the power. Here comes the invisible power supernatural creative force of Almighty God to fix that, only we shut up. We quit doing it. We thought of other things to study. How many missionary journeys Paul took? Where he went? What kind of boat he had when the ship wrecked? 
Sea of Galilee and how deep it is and this and that and the other. And yin, yin, yin. It's all interesting and it's all probably not a bad thing to know, but we should stay on a focal point at least once a day. We should wake up to the fact of who we are and what we're doing here and why. We shouldn't be wondering like a lost person, why am I here? We should know why we're here, and if we know why we're here, then we ought to do something about it. Every morning, if you, you don't get with God, get on the same page with Him, and then pick a fight. You don't have, it's no good to be in the army of God and, and all you do is worship God. That's not, what we're not here just to worship God. And we're not going to, we're not created to go to heaven and just worship God. This whole thing is going to be very labor. And God's got all kind of things for human beings to be doing for this eternity's over with. And yes, it's good to worship God, but that's not the only reason we're here. To hear, to hear uh, some songs, some modern praise and worship songs, you would think that's the object of the event. It is not. The kingdom is the object of the event. It takes worship to do it right. I mean, there's, it takes a lot of things. We need to know about faith. We need to know about the word. We need to know about worship. We need to know about praise. We need to know about things. There's a lot of things we need to know, but that's not the... If that's not the helm that runs the ship. <laughs> Focus, the focal point is what, is what God, the will of the Father from the very get-go hasn't changed and it never will. He is the same all the time and his plan is not going to vary. And it doesn't matter whether our interests flip around or not. God's God's interests are a rock. They don't move. He's not movable. You know why people are so hard-headed? They're made in God's image. He doesn't move. Absolutely doesn't. Now, he's always right. Thank God he doesn't move because he's never wrong. And thank God people can move because many times they need to change their mind. So number one, mindset. Set your mind on the kingdom, and uh, if it gets unset, reset it. There's the mindset, and then there's the reset. It's okay to have a reset button and just poke it once in a while. Have you ever noticed a reset button? If 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 it doesn't need poked, it doesn't hurt anything to poke it anyway. <clears throat> you should check your reset button and poke it once in a while. It might have flipped off. Click it back on. What would that be? Kingdom. What am I doing about the kingdom? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven today, right now, today in my life, in my circumstances. Number two, uh, as royal children, you know what, we should, we should read before I go any farther. Let's get uh, First Peter up, uh, chapter 2. We haven't looked at this yet tonight, have we? First Peter chapter two. <clears throat> I'll just start reading chapter two in, in the Amplified Bible. It's a little wordy. I'm gonna read pretty fast. So be done with every trace of wickedness, depravity, malignity, and all deceit and insincerity, pretense, hypocrisy, judges, envy, jealousy, slander, evil speaking of every kind. You're gonna have to turn off TV, evidently, because that's all that's on there. That is a list of primetime television. Verse 2, like newborn babies, you should crave and thirst for, earnestly desire the pure, unadulterated spiritual milk that 
by it, you may be nurtured and grow into completed salvation. Now, it, once you've got on the milk of God, you don't just give it up. You get some meat and uh, keep drinking the milk. Eat the meat, drink the milk, whatever else it takes. It's word. Since you have already tasted the goodness and kindness of the Lord, come to him then. To that living stone which men tried and threw away, but which is chosen and precious in God's sight. Come and like living stones, be yourselves built into a spiritual house for a holy, dedicated, consecrated priesthood to offer up those spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable and pleasing to God through Jesus Christ. For thus it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a chosen, honored, precious chief cornerstone. And he who believes in him, who adheres to, trusts in, relies on him, shall never be disappointed or put to shame. That doesn't mean that you've made, just made him Lord of your life, but that you rely on him, walk with him, spend your time in this continually, all the time. Now let's turn uh, to go on down to verse 9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a dedicated nation. This is the church. God's own purchased special people that you may set forth the wonderful deeds and display the virtues and perfections of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people at all, but now you are God's people. Once you were unpitied, but now you are pitied and have received mercy. So we've, we've already got what it takes to be God's priest in the earth. What, what do priests do? They represent God to the people and people to God. They intercede. They get in between things that people are pulling down around themselves, judgment that they're pulling down on themselves. The priest gets in between that, between the judgment and the people, and takes up, takes up an intercessory role in between. Get in the middle of it, in the invisible, and fight. The, the, the priests of God are also the soldiers in his army. Hallelujah. And, and we're also kings. We're kings and priests. The king decrees, and then when we decree, we get in between what we, what we the blessing we prayed in there and the curse they're pulling down on themselves. We get in between that, and we just stand there and fight. Why? Because it's a good day to fight and never die. See that movie? It's a good day to die. Remember that stupid. It's a good day. It's never a good day to die. And well, it's a good day to die if you're lost. Because the old man needs to die and you need to come back to life. A new creature in Christ Jesus. Old things passed away, all things become new. And once you do that, you're never dying again. That's all the dying you're ever going to do. It's a good day to live. People paint on their motorcycle, born to die. What a stupid thing to paint on a bike. Born to live, it'd be a little bit better confession. It'd also be scripturally accurate. We're born to live. We're born to rule and we're born to reign. We're born to represent the kingdom of heaven in this earth. We are born, God's kingdom is, full. Well, we'll get to that point. I better get back on track. What did I, I said number two, royal children. As royal children of our heavenly father, we can take charge of our circumstances. You don't have, you don't, there's no such thing as being a victim of circumstances if you're a child of the king. Circumstances are a victim of, they're the victim. You're not the victim. 
circumstances are to bow their knee to the name of Jesus and they're to turn around from a curse into a blessing. That's what they're for. Circumstances are there to be turned into a blessing. That's what they're for. When, from our point of view, from our vantage point as kings, all a negative circumstance is is a, something to, a place to fight. Stake yourself down in that lentil field and let, the, let that authority rip. Hallelujah. Then uh, the third point. Uh, Jesus came to retrain us, show us what God intended in the first place. Show us what God meant for Adam because Jesus was Adam over again. He was the last Adam, and he showed us all the way through his life, really, but the, for three and a half years in particular, what a minister, anointed of Almighty God with the Spirit of God on the inside of him, what he looks like, what he sounds like, where he goes, why he goes, what he does when he gets there. And we follow every word he said and copy him just as close as we can. He said, I don't do anything unless the Father shows me, tells me, and I do whatever he bids, whenever he bids, whatever he says. I don't add to it, but I don't subtract from it. If he told me to do it, I do it. If he told me to say it, I say it. If he told me to hold my peace, I hold my peace. If he said say it, I say it. So whenever you wonder why did Jesus not heal that guy, walk by that lame man, time after time after time, every time he went in and out of the temple, and then Peter and John come along, got him healed. Why didn't Jesus do that? He's better at it than they were, and he's there all the time. Jesus didn't do it. The Holy Spirit did. And it, the, he, he, the Holy Spirit wasn't better at it in Jesus than he was in Peter because it worked. He didn't do it because the Father didn't tell him to. And when Peter got there, he did because the Father told him to. This, this is why. Why did that happen? Well, if it was good, it was because somebody heard God did what he said. The Father's in charge. Hallelujah. And it doesn't work any different than that for Jesus and Peter than it does for you and I. We get up in the morning... Get, our, get, our, get your orders. You don't have to witness to everybody in town to be a witness for God. You need to pray. And like Smith Wigglesworth said, who do you want me to get born again today? Show him to me. And then let him show you. It'll be effective because God knows who's ready and who's not. You won't be wasting so much time knocking on a whole bunch of doors. Knock on the right one. He's your, he's your uh, teacher, counselor. He knows everything. And God wants people born again desperately. He, he wants witnesses to witness to people. And it might as well be when the time is just right. Hallelujah. Uh, Jesus came to restore God's rulership on this earth through mankind. The way God set this up is he wanted the human being to be working with him and be the king. He, the kingdom of heaven is where God rules. The kingdom of God in the earth is where God gave man to rule, turned it over to man to rule it. So he expects that's what he wants. If he didn't do it because he didn't want it that way. He did it because he does want it that way. And he wants to rule. God wants to rule down here, but he wants to do it through his church. Thank God he does. Makes our job important. It, it, we're not just an also-ran, you know, in God's way. And, oh, that's cute, kid. Now get out of the way and I'll take it from here. That's not what this is about. It's about a partnership, hearing God doing what he says so the human part is done and staying out of the God part of it so that God can do that part and not begging God to do what he said you're supposed to do and not getting in his way trying to do what he said he'd take care of. It's a partnership 
but the parts are important. The fourth point out of five is that um, God's done this eternally. This will of God and this kingdom isn't going to pass. This isn't going to pass away. This isn't going away. This is what he wants. This is what he's going to get. Now, it's going to change right now. We're, we're closing in on the end of the church age. There's going to be a tribulation. Then Jesus is coming back, and there's going to be a thousand-year reign of Jesus on the earth, and then the devil's going to be loose, and there's going to be a train wreck, and then God's going to come and fix that, and then we're going into eternity. So there are some things that are going to go on, but it just gets better and better and better. Once, the, once Jesus comes back to earth, it's going to get real good real fast. You, you know why there's such a heart hunger in mankind to have a one rule, one world government? I mean, people that don't care about all the politics and everything, why can't everybody just get along? Why can't we just have one ruler in charge? Well, the reason is the evil's in the earth, and uh, it, it can't work like that. It would be a horrible thing if it did. But the hunger's in there because we were, we have a desire on the inside of us to have this perfect. And when you have a perfect king in a one world kingdom, you have perfection. It's going to be good. The millennium's going to be a hoot. It's going to be good every day, day after day, after day after day for a thousand years of human beings having babies without birth control, what's that going to be like? With no idiot saying um, the, it, the idiotic word of overpopulation. You know what God, if they've ever overpopulated this planet, you know what he'd do? He'd just bring the parts that got dumped under the ocean back up where they belong and just give us more land, that's all. You don't think so? <laughs> you like the ocean? <clears throat> Salt water. Miles and miles and miles and miles and miles and miles and miles of salt water in me with no gills. No fin. Mermaids aren't real. It's not good. It's not what God had in mind. There was a train wreck called the Days of Peleg, and when that happened, <clears throat> cities fell to the bottom where we're just now making submarines that can find some of them. They're down there, so huge cities, megalith, things, things made with things we don't even know what they made them with, so big we don't know how they moved them. And they're down there, you know, this stupid number of miles down in the water. And the very same fossils that are down there that far are found in Peru up there. Those bleed high. <clears throat> Why would God make something so high a man can't breathe on it without an ox oxygen tank? He didn't. Sin did that. Sin wreaked havoc in this planet, and parts of it went out of sight, and parts of it shot up where it doesn't belong, and the whole thing's a wreck. And the wreck's beautiful. Think what it was like before it got wrecked. We're going to see it again. God's going to recreate it, put it back right down to my last point. What did I see? Four. <clears throat> Jesus came to restore. No, no. What do, I'm on five. G, uh, Jesus. Mission on earth, and we've probably, probably explained this one already, and it's good because we're running out of time, but Jesus' main mission on earth was to reintroduce the kingdom of God to mankind so that human beings could find out what God was up to in the first place and get us back on the right page. And 
all that's required is for a little cooperation to come from a human being and to quit allowing yourself to be interested in all the sidetracks that uh, the devil can cook up through religion and through, uh, you know, just curiosity. You know, the human being has um, this curiosity thing working in their mind all the time. And uh, they actually, that's where the devil went to get Eve in trouble in the first place. She was curious. And that curiosity um, is not necessarily a bad thing, provided you've got a rock to keep uh, and a light to keep from wrecking on the rocks. You, you need a guide, the written word. The Spirit of God is, your, is God on the inside of you, but without this guide, there's so many voices in the world that disguise themselves, and some of them disguise herself as an angel of light, and sometimes people get mixed up with an angel of light in their head and the Spirit of God in their heart, and you have good, well-meaning Christian people that are just flat being silly and getting off on something goofy because they got off the word. They got to following voices and got off the word. So it's not just hearing God. It's not just walking with the Holy Spirit. It's walking with the Holy Spirit. Uh, <clears throat> Kenneth Hagin said it this way, Father, I believe you said that to me, but I need you to show it to me in a word so that I know. And he'll always give you, the Bible said, two or three witnesses. He'll show you where it's at in here. Just ask him. And that way, all the revelations will hook together. Never, once you have a revelation from God, don't throw that away because you heard something new. Pray about it. Walk with the Spirit of God and show him how it fits with what he's already showed you so that you grow from one level of glory to another level of glory, but you don't ever shipwreck because you don't just throw away everything you learned to jump over here in this new thing that's so mentally, it's so mentally pleasing. It's so interesting that oh, it's got to be right. I was off that far, and now I'm over here. Whoa, and people do that all the time. It's, uh, it's not scriptural. It's not safe. It's a good way to uh, wreck your ship. Follow the, follow the revelations you've already. Never throw away a revelation. A revelation is something that you got straight from God that you put to work and it worked. If it worked once, it'll work again, and it'll work again, and it'll work again, and it'll work again, and it'll work again because it's the Word of God, and He's not going to change it. And if it worked once, it'll work every single time it's put to work. Every single time it's put to work. You'll never throw that away because something flashy, pretty, sparkles, and is interesting. That's a trap. Watch out for them. Not that, not that new revelation isn't interesting. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying every, it's the old saying, it's not Bible, everything that glitters isn't gold. It's just shiny. Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus for uh, giving us these reset buttons, for giving us things to uh, look at regularly to keep us on track, to keep us in the fighting position, the fighting mode that we need to be in in 2023 and 24. We're here for a purpose. You put, you put us here in this place on purpose because you wanted us here and you've got a job for us to do while we're here and we thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for, uh, for setting up a kingdom where you, where you give us responsibility and uh, power, partnership. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.